Okay, so we are very happy to have Steve from Stanford, and he will tell us about wormholes without averaging. Please stop. Well, I'm, I'm glad to be able to give this talk. I apologize for not being able to be there in person, but hopefully that will happen in the not too distant future. So what I'm gonna talk about is uh, based on a paper that uh, my colleagues and I wrote last spring called Wormholes Without Averaging. And probably the most important part of my talk uh, is to emphasize my collaborators, uh, Bill Saab, a former student at Stanford, who's now at the Institute for Advanced Study as a postdoc. Douglas Stanford, who's a faculty member at Stanford. And Shen Yu Yao, who's uh, currently a, a graduate student to, at Stanford. And so let me start by just uh, giving some background. And uh, I'll, I hope you'll forgive me. I will inject a little bit of propaganda as well. Um, the context that we'll be discussing is this marvelous uh, uh, relationship of gauge gravity duality that gives us our best current definition of what quantum gravity is. And in gauge gravity duality, we know the rules for the boundary, the non-gravitational quote unquote gauge system. Although it is a complicated system, we can't solve it at least in the systems of interest, but we know its definition, we know its equations. And I just want to underline that now, 25 or so years after the advent of these uh, ideas, we still don't know the rules for the bulk. It's not a question of solving them. We just don't even know the equations to solve. We know lots of pieces of them. I mean, it's not for nothing that uh, many of us have spent much of our time studying this the system, but we don't know uh, the complete set of rules. And a lot of the questions we're grappling with involve that ignorance of the rules. So the, the part that I'll talk about a lot today is the factorization puzzle. Um, or did I quite a while ago by these people in this context and show how it illustrates our ignorance of these rules. So just to remind you, uh, in the ADS-CFT context, you have two decoupled systems called L and R. You compute the partition function of the combined system. Well, so from the boundary perspective, you have two decoupled quantum systems, decoupled Hamiltonians, decoupled Hilbert spaces. And so you compute uh, the combined system looks like that. The partition function is obviously the product. Z left, right is the product of Z left times Z right. It obviously factorizes. But from the bulk perspective, the rule, well, a popular set of rules, it's not, we don't know if it's the right rule, is you take every boundary and you draw all the geometries that can fill in the boundaries. Now, this is just a guess. And there's geometries that look like this. These are Euclidean black holes. This is maybe a Euclidean time circle. Um, and, but in addition, you can draw these kind of wormhole configurations, these space-time wormholes that link left and right. And these things pretty evidently are an obstacle to factorization. This thing factorizes, but this won't. Now, if you, in simple models, these things are weighted by the Euler character of the surfaces. This is Euler character one. So it's weighted by e to the entropy. This is Euler character one. This thing is e to the two s. And this thing is the Euler character of the cylinder is zero. So this is weighted by e to the zero or one. So this is a small violation of factorization, but you can arrange things as we will so that these parts don't contribute, let's say at late time. And then this is a leading contribution. So you can isolate this problem and, uh, and you have to decide what to do with it. We're supposed to know the rules in the bulk. What do you do with this thing? Now, perhaps these wormholes should not be included in the gravitational path in them, this mythical object that we think uh, encapsulates rules in the bulk. But they're turning out to be useful. I've listed uh, some recent applications. The one that we'll focus on is the long time so-called ramp behavior in the spectral form factor. And there's such a ramp in correlation functions as well. 
Now, some of these examples, like the spectral form factor, involve decoupled boundary systems. This is the partition function of a left system times the partition function of a right system. And so the wormhole explanation brings with it a factorization puzzle. So we have to figure out you know, how to make our piece. If we want the good things about solving, about explaining phenomena here, what do we do about this problem? Well, it turns out the controlled calculations for wormholes, let's say in the spectral form factor, have been done in simple models like uh, SYK or JT gravity. They're described by ensembles of boundary systems, collections of a number of boundary systems weighted by a probability. If we denote the average of an ensemble by angle brackets, we would find from the wormhole that average of Z left right is not the same as average of Z left average of z right. Well, the property of averages don't guarantee you uh, that you'll preserve factorization. So there's no factorization puzzle. It's often the case that you have relationships like this when there's correlation. And in fact, uh, ensembles and wormholes have a long history going back to the 80s and the work of Coleman, Giddings and Strominger. These ideas have been reformulated interest, uh, recently by Merolf and Maxfield in the ads CFT context. But even so, in these ensemble systems, you can formulate a version of the factorization puzzle. What happens for one element of the ensemble? That is, you have all these different things weighted by probability. Let's say I just pick one of them, one of the random set of couplings in SYK, one of the random matrices in GT gravity. Then you have one quantum system that things should factorize. What happens? Now, there's been some, I guess, the polite word is confusion about the role of ensembles. And so I should articulate my, my view here. My, my view is we don't really expect standard holographic systems like Super Yang Mills to be described by ensembles. But as of now, we don't have the necessary tools to address these subtle questions like the factorization puzzle like other questions I'll talk about. Without, in, in these systems like super angles, we just don't know enough about the rules of the ball. The hope is that the mechanisms uncovered in these simple ensemble systems might teach us something about the more complicated ones. And so that's the motivation. It's not so much that the idea of ensembles is, is necessarily applicable here, but there might be lessons that we can learn. The other point that I'll, I'll come to later is that ensembles are powerful. We'll be looking at all kinds of complicated, kind of noisy things. Sometimes it's hard to calculate details, but calculating statistics is easy. Well, there's a basic result about ensembles. If you're in a region where wormholes dominate, then the variance of the combined system just given by the expectation value of the square minus um, the average uh, of, of the quantity squared is of order the signal squared. You do this by introducing uh, uh, an extra system, sometimes called a replica or a copy. So you have LR and then you have L prime R prime and you draw all the geometries connecting them. So there's two wormholes like that. That's just the single signal squared. But then there are other possible configurations. And these um, correspond to the variance. And by permutation symmetry, these things are about as big as this. So that says that the variance, that is how much the answer changes if you go from one element of the ensemble to the other, is about as big as the signal. So the answer depends sensitively on which element of the ensemble you're looking at. You could say it's noisy. And it turns out that noise and factorization are two parts of the same story. And we expect the noise to be present in non-average systems. So to be specific, let's look at S, the spectral form factor in one element of the SYK ensemble, one set of, of fermion couplings. And here, my favorite graph in this subject is what you get if you just do the experiment. The blue line is the average over a whole bunch of Js. The red line is one sample. 
This early time thing just describes the behavior of two disconnected disks. The wormhole dominates on this so-called ramp. And there you see that the fluctuations are about the same size of the signal. This is a log-log plot, which makes that uh, constant width. And we'll ignore here this plateau region for this talk. So a fixed microscopic Hamiltonian, like the fermion Hamiltonian, gives you noise. It's an aspect of the microstructure, the fact that you have these discrete energy levels in the system. Now, random matrix universality, the fact that quantum chaotic systems are described, their level statistics are described by random matrices, tells you that you have a ramp, but it also tells you that the fluctuations around the ramp are this, are this nature. Um, so we expect to have a ramp and noise of this kind in any quantum chaotic system, like super Yang Mills. These examples engage gravity duality. We know that these systems are, in fact, maximally chaotic. But you might say, what do you do with this noise? If you have a fixed system, there is still something you can do. You can look at different times. Different times here are almost uncorrelated. They actually act kind of like different samples. So you can do time averaging. You have a lot of time here. This is a log scale. And you can get a nice smooth signal. And in fact, that signal is just what the wormhole would predict. So this nice Seuss signal that in ensemble systems is described by a wormhole is possible to extract in a non-average system like super Yang mills So this raises the possibility that something like a wormhole plays a role in super Yang mills even though there's no ensemble. And the key question, the question that we're going to wrestle with, and we won't answer completely, but we'll find some hints, is what accounts for the noise in the bulk description? Well, let's look at just at one partition function, not the modulus square. It decays rapidly. That's the square root of this behavior. And then it starts oscillating around zero at late time. The average of this will be zero at large time. And the variance of it, the spread here, will grow with time in such a way that when you take the modulus squared of this thing, you'll get this linear ramp. Now, this thing squared, it factorizes. You get a product of two of these things. And in fact, the error in factorization is the wormhole signal, but the noise is that same size. The noise is of the right size to play a role in restoring factorization when added to the wormhole. And that's what will happen. Now, like time averaging, perhaps there are certain types of approximate ensembles for standard holographic systems like super Yang mills that will help isolate the gravitational part of the signal. They'll isolate the wormhole from the noise. All right, so now let's try hey, to get into question? the... Yes, please, please. Uh, when you say isolate these two parts from each other, it's the idea that the gravitational effect is the thing that has a semi-classical interpretation and the other part does not. Something like that. It'll have some, it'll, they'll have different interpretations. Um, and, and the idea would be, yes, that the, the thing, let's say you'd get by time averaging, that you might, uh, the, this, the way the story will go, at least in <clears throat> toy models, is that you'll have a nice gravitational contribution, something that you could draw geometry for. And then you'll have another contribution that's noisy, where it's much more mysterious what its uh, quote unquote geometrical realization is. But then if you average that thing, those mysterious parts average to zero. And I, you're left with a quote unquote geometry. But as you, as you said, we would expect that um, that would just get us back to the ensemble, right? So if we want to stick with that one single theory, we, we don't want to average over these things. We want to keep them around. And, and we'd like to understand what the bulk description of them looks like. Would you agree? Absolutely. That, that will be the goal. But the idea is that um, these uh, sort of simple things like the wormhole, it's not like they don't exist. It's not like they were a mistake. 
at least it's possible. We don't know that for sure. But even in a non-average system, these obstructions to factorization could well be there. But you would have to find these other things that correct their mistake. But that's, is that a little risky to claim that? Because you know, when, I have a, when I have a bunch of terms in an equation, um, I mean, I, I, can, I, I can always add zero and add more terms and then say, well, that means that all of them exist. Um, I mean, these, these things all contribute. Um, but I think that from the bulk point of view, the separation into the wormhole contribution and everything else is probably justified only if we can give a bulk interpretation also for everything else. Agree, agree, agree. That, that's, that, that, that's absolutely right. And, and the, we don't, you know, because we don't have the tools to study superiangles, I don't know what's in the superiangles yeah. bulk description. I, I can't answer that question. The best I can do is to take these models we can handle and ask what happens if we don't average, if we, if we take one element of the ensemble. Mm -hmm. Does it work like that? It could work another way. If you took one element of the ensemble, you could have no wormholes at all. And it, and it could only be after you average that the wormhole emerges. And it turns out that's not the way it works, at least in these simple systems. And, and, but, but you're right, super AI mills could work in some completely different way, we don't know. So, so this is, again, just trying to see what the possibilities are and, and, uh, uh, and, and, and understand uh, what mechanisms are, uh, what me mechanisms might exist. And, and we don't know which one Super Yang Mills chooses. Um, Thanks. <coughs> Hi. Yeah. Yes, please, uh, please. Isn't it true that uh, at this level of uh, mechanism, uh, ensemble need not to be need not be ensemble of theories, right? Ensemble of states like microstates or black hole, you certainly don't have time to discriminate it. So you're just kind of uh, like averaging in time. So uh, like interior of black hole and so on shows up only as a property of the things which is insensitive to to the uh, details of microstates, right? Well, by the theory of the black hole, you mean the geometrical theory. Uh, that's, that's what you meant, the, the coarse grain yes, geometry? Yes, yes, like interior. interior yeah, I, I, that, that actually, well, the interior, I, I don't know. I don't actually, I don't want to commit myself to that. No, mm -hmm. that's not obvious to me. Um, I, no, that's not obvious. In fact, we'll see that, uh, um, I, 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 some of these examples suggest to me that it's not like a fuzzball type situation, for instance. The, the thing about one thing about averaging over states is it doesn't smooth out this noise this as a function of time. The states don't to, to, to smooth out this noise, you have to rattle around these different energy levels and move them up and down a little bit. Mm -hmm. And if you have a fixed Hamiltonian, the energy levels don't move. Yeah. So, so, states, so you won't get rid of this noise for states. And so that's not enough. You have to do something else. Now, again, time averaging is enough. You can do that on a fixed system. This has a long history. You know, people studying specific systems like the Riemann zeta function, it's one system. And they argue that it behaves like this, then they did some kind of averaging, something like time averaging. Okay. And so that this, this gives you the, the ability to talk about statistical quantities, even for a fixed system. Yeah, but it's, it's not kind of happening in a realistic situation that any detector and so on cannot resolve the time infinitely. Well, precisely. I, I, uh, I'm not sure. I mean, you know, uh, I'm not sure why you couldn't put a black hole in a box, you know, and, and go for a very long time. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. If it's a very long time, yes. Uh, if it's not evaporating, it's on the black hole in something yeah, special. Yeah, so I think, I think it I, is I, a I question something. as a matter of principle. <laughs> You know, I, I that that's what, that's what these and this time is not actually all that long. The time when this short starts out is what's called the thallus time. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. like log of the entropy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. not that long a time. You can even see it, I think, in some kind of evaporating situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Okay, sure. All right, so now we're going to try to do this in uh, this very concrete system, the SYK model.
we're going to say, suppose you have just one set of J's. This would be like one particular Hamiltonian, like super Yang Mills. It's not as elegant as super Yang Mills, but you just pull a set of J's out of uh, the ensemble and you forget about the rest. And to figure out like what is the quote unquote bulk description of that. Now the story is not too complicated, but it's still complicated enough that I'll only be able to give a bit of a sketch here. But it's explained reasonably uh, thoroughly in this in the preprint. All right. Just to remind you, in SYK, it's standard to construct path integrals for average quantities, average over J's, like partition functions, in terms of collective fields that are usually called G and sigma. Um, and the crucial thing is that these Gs and sigmas are like proxies for bulk variables. Like uh, suppose you have a left system and a right system, then like Z left, the partition function of the left system, you'll need uh, collective fields composed of bilinears of left fermions, called that G left left, that depends on a bilocal time argument. And then you'll need a, a it turns out a Lagrange multiplier field sigma to come along with it. And uh, at the crucial link, and this goes back to Malthusian, Stanford, Yang, uh, uh, Jensen, and so on, is that at low temperatures, this collective field expectation value is given by the correlator on a certain two-dimensional gravity geometry. You put in bulk fermion fields of a certain mass, and then you calculate the propagator on this geometry, and that gives you the answer that SYK finds. It's in this sense that the model uh, has some kind of a bulk description. Now, there's all kinds of other crap in the bulk, and uh, we don't know a lot about the system. But, oops, it's an extremely oversimplified model. But the great thing about it, as far for our point of view, and what really makes it worthwhile is we have an explicit representation for the entire quote unquote gravitational path. In. That is you're integrating over these two things, G and Sigma, two bilocals in time with an action that you know. And so it's not this, this mysterious mythical object, the gravitational path integral. I mean, this is the, you know, the origin of a lot of our discontents. We don't know what it is. Here in this toy, we know what it is. Okay, so in principle, we can explore all its nooks and crannies and figure out where all this weird stuff comes from. Because okay, it's in front of us. Now, there are wormholes in this SYK, as many of you know. Suppose you have a left and a right system, you can find a left right collective field that's psi left times psi right. And then uh, G left right is given by the correlator, one uh, fermion on the left side, one fermion on the right side. It describes some kind of connection through the wormhole, like a geodesic running along the wormhole. There's no factorization problem if wormholes contribute to this average because averaging over couplings, you use the same J's on the left and the right, introduces explicit correlations between left and right. And the result doesn't have to factor. Now, for future reference, wormholes also have non-trivial G left left and G right right. But the shape of them is different than on the Euclidean black hole, the disk, because the geometry is different. This thing dips a little deeper than this thing does. So from G left left, you can tell the difference on this end from a wormhole and from a Euclidean black hole from a disk. And now the point is, we'll be able to write a G sigma type integral for Z left times Z right for fixed couplings without averaging over the couplings. And then we can ask the question, what happens to the wormholes? If they remain, which it turns out they will, how does this thing factorize as it must? 
Now, I have to tell you that we were only able to study this problem in detail, really to the end, in a toy squared model. By that, I mean a toy of a toy, a toy model of the toy model. Okay. We had to take SYK, and instead of having a quantum mechanical system where you have Grassmann fields as a function of time, we had to study Grassmann variables at one time point. That is just one ordinary Grassmann number. So we're studying ordinary Grassmann numbers uh, with n Grassmann numbers. So here's the partition function at one time point. It's integral over n Grassmann numbers, these random couplings, you pick one set of them times uh, these Grassmann numbers. So you can just expand this out and do the uh, Grassmann intervals. See? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's kind of a follow up on the previous question, just to make sure I still. Yeah, yeah. Well, like, um, so this calculation is done in uh, in the boundary theory, right? Yes. And then the point is that you're going to find terms that are exactly those corresponding to the wormholes for which we have a bulk interpretation. Yes. And you're going to find other terms that restore factorization. And then you're going to probably try and discuss their possible bulk interpretations at the sort of layout here. That that's that's the layout. Yes. Thanks. Now the the second part will be. You know, they'll be waving of hands. We don't know the answer for what's so happening, but yeah. that's the strategy. Yeah, that's the strategy. Exactly. Is to is to um, we have and and again the the key point that that motivates this is we know the entire gravitational path in okay in this toy. So therefore, the model doesn't have any choice but to yield to us how it factorizes. Okay, it might be hard to see, but the model has to do it. Okay. And so instead of seeing it in terms of the obvious boundary fermions, we want to see it in these non obvious collective field variables. And that's that's will be the, the goal. Okay, so this. Um, and so, okay. oh, so, so you're saying, yeah. I, I think you're saying actually something stronger than what I anticipate. So, so in fact, you're saying because of the way that these quantities that appear in the SYK path integral can be packaged as these G and sigma quantities yes. in the bulk, uh, that sort of gives you some guidance as to the bulk interpretation of the uh, of the factorization restoring terms. Absolutely. Yes. I, I don't mean we're just going to argue for factorization because, oh, it, it's a product of two Hamiltonians. Yeah. I mean, there, there's this G sigma uh, presentation that is this kind of, uh, it's really a boundary thing, but it, it's a hint toward the bulk. And, and so that's the idea. The idea is to understand factorization in these non-obvious variables. So the, the calculation is still done on the, on the boundary, but the new terms are written in terms of the Gs and sigmas, and that helps you get back to the bulk. Or are you and, that, and, and, and the, the hope is that will help us get back to the bulk. Yeah. But you're not that's carrying right. out a gravitational path integral for the single theory case. Well, we, I mean, I wouldn't even know. I mean, the only thing we think is a gravitational path integral is the G sigma. Is a, yeah. yeah. All right. So, so now we need two of these things. So here's Z left times Z right. We have two copies of N Grassmann numbers. Okay. And so we have the same J for the left fermions and for the right fermions. And now we introduce these collective left right fields. Okay. Well, the way you do this, I'll just go through it. You introduce a factor of one by putting in a delta function. Here's the integral over g left right, which is just a number. It doesn't depend on two time arguments because there's only one time point. Okay, so it's just a number. Delta function saying g left right is this fermion bilinear. And this exponential, whereas if the delta function clicks, g left right to the fourth is the same as this thing to the fourth. So this is just one. Then we represent the delta function by an integral of our Lagrange multiplier, the sigma. We have integral d sigma, sigma times uh, these things. Now, if we average over j's, by, they're weighted by Gaussians. You know, you complete the square and you get psi left to uh, this thing squared. 
But because psi psi is zero, that term doesn't contribute. Same for psi right squared. So you get psi left times psi rights. Rearranging them, you see it's the same as this. And so when you integrate, when you put this in and integrate over the J's, you see all these complicated fermion uh, eightfold expressions cancel. And you're just left um, with just a, bi a bilinear in, in Grassmann's, which you can integrate out to give uh, you know, uh, a Fafian, which in this case is just this number raised to the n. And then you're left with this term and a, a G sigma term. And that is the entire averaged uh, integrand that you have to deal with. Steve, so can I ask a yeah. question yeah. about the... Um, Please. So uh, when you introduced the G number on the previous page, mm -hmm. um, you, you wrote this symbol that was an integral over R. Now, I would think that an integral over a Grassmann even variable is a different thing than an integral over R. It's, it turns out can it's you not. actually? Well, it's not. What? This is an integral over g, which is a right, which is a, a a number. How do you assign a real number to the product of two Grassmann variables? Well, it turns out the rules of Grassmann integration make this kind of thing uh, legitimate. I see. I mean, you do all the manipulations you think you can do; they all work. The I easiest see. way okay. is just to try it for a few. Yeah, things, yeah. and all of it works. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, all right, so we have this two-dimensional gravitational path integral. These are just two numbers, g and sigma. And then there's whatever was left over from those manipulations. We'll call it the average action. And then you can just find the saddle points of this two-dimensional integral. And it has saddle points when g left right absolutely absolute value is signal left right absolute value equals one. Turns out it has several saddle points, but I, I won't worry about that. You sum over all of them. And so it turns out that these saddle points correspond to non-trivial correlation because G left right is like psi left psi right. And so this corresponds to this wormhole connecting left and right. There's no such thing as a disk here because psi left times psi left is just zero. So K is the wormhole we care about. So we've gotten rid of the disk. That's, that's the way it goes. So we can represent in this toy model like a line between left and right, representing this saddle point, as the analog of this uh, wormhole. If we did the more uh, the full time-dependent SYK model. All right, so the thing, that's, that's the average story. That's not our interest. That, this is warm up. Our interest is now when we don't average. We just take one fixed set of J's. Well, we do the same thing. We introduce a factor of one, this delta function. Um, this should be G to the fourth, so. You introduce the delta function as an integral over sigma. Now there are no cancellations between these various uh, things involving Grassmann to the eighth or these things involving Grassman to the fourth. So the action contains complicated Grassman terms like these, including ones that depend on the particular choice of J. It's just a Grassman interval over, you know, N Grassman numbers. If N was 27, 28, you could just do it. You know, it'd be very lengthy, but you could just do it. So you'd get, a, a result that you could package as an action, call it the fixed action, that would depend on J, which I've left implicitly here. And it's got all of the structure of the model in it. But still, it's just a two-dimensional integral. So in principle, what we want to do is study this two-dimensional integral for a fixed set of J's. And for some places, we can actually do this numerically, but it turns out it's hard even for moderately interesting values of n. But what we can do um, is we can ask about the statistics of this fixed action. Now, 
I guess I got ahead of myself. This, this product of partition functions has order one noise. That means it's how much does it change when you change the J's? Where in this G sigma two dimensional integral does that noise come from? It turns out the integral over G doesn't depend on J. So just integrate it out. And we get Z left, Z right. There's a one dimensional integral, an integral over sigma of some function that depends on N and uh, J and sigma, of course. And we can ask where in this integral, this one dimensional integral, does the noise come? Which parts of this integration depend on J and which don't? We can't compute this thing effectively, but we can use the powers of ensemble so we can compute its statistical properties. We can compute its variance over different J's. It turns out you introduce additional collective fields. You have a cop second copy of the system like that L prime R prime system, have more collective fields. And then you evaluate the integral by doing saddle points. You compare it to the average of F, the quantity squared. The difference will give you the variance. And this average of F just determines the average of this. This must contain the wormhole cell. And you can ask, well, what region in this integrand is noisy? That is when F squared is much different than the average of F squared. And then that's the place you have to look for the non-gravitational stuff. So if the average of F squared is about the same as the average of F quantity squared, the noise at that particular value of sigma is small. The jargon is it's self-averaging. Otherwise, the noise is large. Call it non-self-averaging. Here's a line in sigma. It turns out you have to be a little careful. This is a complex integral. Here you have to pick a particular contour in the complex plane. But uh, for the purposes of this talk, just think of it as a line. And the wormhole saddle is at this value of sigma. That's like sigma equals one. There's a region away from sigma equals one where the integral is still self-averaging. The wormhole aver saddle in particular is self-averaging. Even for fixed J, its contribution doesn't depend on J's. But there's this other piece of the integral. This is about 0.56 or something, where things are not self-averaging. So this wormhole saddle persists for a single coupling. We can now ask where the biggest noisy contributions come from. We can study the root mean square value of this integrand F. That's the thing we're integrating after all. Where do its biggest contributions come from? So we can compute the square root of the average of F. This won't be noisy, but it'll tell us kind of where the big signals are and where the small signals are. Let's plot it like an action. Let's take the uh, log of it and divide by n. And this is a graph of this action, little f, versus sigma. Now, I guess I should write on this a little bit. This wormhole saddle corresponds to this place. It's sigma equals 1. That's the wormhole that I'll call it. This other place, now remember, this is an action divided, it's got a one over n down here. So anything that's not as absolute maximum value is exponentially suppressed in n. These regions are exponentially suppressed in n. But there's this other region that's just as high as the wormhole. It's at sigma equals zero. So there's another region here Turns out it's sigma equals zero. That gives the same size contribution as this. And that this thing must describe at large n the entire integral. And we give a name for this contribution. It's another saddle point. It's, it's sharply peaked at that value of sigma. We'll call it the half wormhole. I'll try to explain a little bit why. 
Now, what would this actually look like if we averaged? So if we plotted uh, just expectation value of F quantity squared, it would look like this red line keeps going with dots down here. So again, in the average theory, you have this contribution. In the non-average theory, this remember, this is a logarithm. It's going to minus infinity. That means that the average of F is zero here. This half wormhole saddle depends so sensitively on J that it averages out to zero if you average. So in the average theory, you just have the wormhole and you don't have factorization. In the non-average theory, you have this plus this. And because it's a, it's a precise evaluation at large n of the integral, it has to factorize. So let me summarize this one point model. This is the, the meat of the, uh, uh, what we actually were able to do. The wormhole saddle will persist if you have a fixed coupling. Their weight is only weakly dependent on the choice of J's. They're self-averaging. A new saddle point exists, the half wormhole. Its weight is strongly dependent on the choice of J's. It's non-self-averaging. And when you add the two together, they give an accurate contribution of this, not averaged. And of necessity, this calculation must agree with the factorized answer computed in like numerically, z left times z right. So this other saddle has to um, restore factorization. And again, upon averaging, this other funny contribution, this half wormhole, vanishes. And all you're left with is this nice wormhole that we've been finding in SYK for a while. All right, so now let's try to extrapolate it to the full SYK model a little bit. We don't have a derivation here. We have a, we have a scenario that, that lines up with this simple model. And unless uh, something serious goes wrong, this seems like a plausible expectation. But I should emphasize that we don't have a completely controlled calculation of this. Well, let's just look at one boundary here, instead of having z left and z right. Well, with one boundary, you have this given by g left left. But it turns out there's another contribution that looks like this where G left left doesn't look like it does on the Euclidean black hole. It looks like it does on the wormhole. Now, again, what, we, what are we trying to explain here? We're trying to explain this signal. This is what one partition function is. This is the disk. Where does this noise come from? We think it comes from I don't know a faster way to do this from this thing. And what defines this configuration is you have G left left. It assumes the values it would have on the disk here, but there's another place with a large contribution where it assumes the values it would have on a wormhole. But there's no G left right because we just have one partition function. So there's nothing to tell us about left-right correlations. So we sort of indicate that by saying that our, our knowledge ends here. G left ref, depending on how far these points are separated, can probe pretty deeply into this geometry. So we think there's a piece of the geometry that looks like this part of the wormhole. And again, I, this thing is noise. Uh... Is, yeah. is intuition coming from that? If you think about uh, a variation of z left, z right, yeah. you compute with a left, right, left prime, right prime system. Yeah. And is this a le left, left prime wormhole? Uh, it's something like that. It actually, it, here, it would be you have a, yes, you have a left, left prime wormhole. Oh, okay. You would double the system. Yeah. And it would, it would be, it's sort of a phantom system you use to compute the variance. That's what this would connect to. 
But that system is just a calculational tool. Yeah. It's not there in the system. Yeah, yeah. So the corresponding object must be there in a in a yeah, so, but this part will be there. Now we could go through the factorization story here, but it's more complicated. You'd have a left and a right, and you'd have those wormholes, and you have other wormholes. Yeah. For the interest of time, I won't go through that here. And instead, let me let me um, but in any event, there are configurations that will plausibly restore factorization in full SYK of this type. Uh, Steve, yeah. this picture that you drew is, is sort of suggestive that you, you, you would have drawn a picture that had both boundaries and a connected geometry for us if it was possible to do that, right? So this is this sort of suggestive of the fact that it's not possible to represent the uh, you know single theory case in the bulk with with a single connected geometry, or am I reading too much into the drawings? Yeah, um, I, I skipped a little bit here. I'm not computing a situation where I physically have two systems, left and right. Mm -hmm. All I have is one system, left. Okay, and then the only things you could draw smoothly would be like this: Euclidean black hole. But that's not enough to account for the full behavior. If you take the Euclidean black hole and let's say analytically continue beta to beta plus it, there's noise in that answer. Where in the integral does that noise come from? That's that wiggly red line on that figure I showed a minute ago. It turns out there's another place, we think there's another place in the G left, left integral that looks like this where the G left left has the configuration that would look like if there was a wormhole in it, but there's not. And then the question is, what is going on here? What is the bulk interpretation of this uh, ignorant region where the question mark is? And we don't know. We're reasonably confident that the piece of the geometry looks like a wormhole in it, but we don't know what completes it. There's not another physical boundary for this wormhole to join onto. I, I would have thought that given that we're in the single theory case, if you went back to the two boundary uh, setup, mm -hmm. by just trivially, it would factorize it. Just you'd be drawing two copies of, of this drawing. Yes, that would be one way of doing it. That would that would be the way that would, yes. And there's a story there that I'll that I, I could get into. The, the story there is that you have a choice when you have two copies of a non-average system. Okay, if you have two copies of a non-average system and you want to write a G left a, a G sigma description, you have a choice. You could either include a G left right field or not. If you don't include a G left right field, all you have is G lefts and G rights. Then the description will be, as you say, you'll have manifestly decoupled things with pictures like this on each side. And that will be a, a perfectly valid description of, the, of a thing. But you could also equally validly write a description including G left right. And that will have a nice wormhole saddle point. It'll have these other things as well with different weighting factors. And those weighting factors will just compensate for the presence of this wormhole. And so there is this multiplicity of bulk descriptions that tells you you can just have manifest factorization, but then describing the smooth ramp when you time average is a miracle. Or you can include the G left right fields, and then seeing this ramp like thing is obvious. But then the noise is comes from these uh, sort of weird things. So what what could be done to resolve that ambiguity? I mean, it's not an ambiguity. It's a choice. It's a choice. It's like right. It's like but, but but in in if I travel through space time, I don't want to have a choice about whether I run into some feature or not. Right. I I I would hope that that's unambiguous. Well, I think I think it would have to be that. As you're traveling down the wormhole, these other things would alter your experience, and so that the two pictures were consistent. I mean, you'd have to sum over them, and they have the same weight. One doesn't dominate over the other. 
And so it would have to be it would have to be that the uh, uh, you know I, I, the experience you have is a question I don't know how to answer. But suppose you computed left right correlates or something like that, you would you would have to get the same answer, and you do uh, in those two descriptions. Mm -hmm. To be honest with you, it's actually, it, it boils down to a way of doing the integral. Suppose you put in this G left right field. You could do the integral, you could just integrate it along its defining contour, and that gives a delta function. And then just get rid of it, do that first. And then you look for the description this way. Or you could, with just decoupled systems, or you could do the G left right integral by saddle point deform the contour, and it'll pass through a wormhole saddle point. So it's a lot like doing a complex integral where there are many different contours you can choose that give the same answer. It, it, is, it, is this at all related to just the, I guess, much simpler and older story of how you can write the thermal field double, you know, as a sum of product states and each one of them doesn't look very connected, but then there's also a different way of writing it. Or is, is the, this, this seems a little more sophisticated than that. Well, well, the, 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 only, the only difference there is we don't have the, this full G sigma interval. You know, we don't know what the bulk integral is, but I think it's very much in that spirit. Um, and the question is, is there a complete description where you include the Einstein-Rosen bridge? And then somehow you have these microstates uh, that are left over, the you know, kind of, or do you just have to regard it as a product? And uh, is the, there the, is there analogy is that uh, you have one one plus two two entangled states, but you have other three entangled states, one one minus two two and one two minus two one, and so something on. like that. But, yes, but then it's you have to right. averaging all product states other than one one plus two two, it just drops out. It's like that. It's like, it's like, it's like, it's like that. And you get, uh, 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 yes. It, it's a little bit like that, yes. Um, I don't know if that's happening in this particular system, but it's yeah, something but it, like but that. But it's yeah. got that flavor, that's yeah. right. I mean, so, you know, the, the analogy that I liked is this old periodic orbit story of chaos yeah. where you have, uh, you know, orbits describing the left and the right system yeah. and you average the systems the only thing that, that doesn't have rapidly varying phases is when the orbit on the left is the same as the orbit on the right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the one you keep. That's Barry's diagonal approximation. Yes, yes. But you so, really do have all the other non-matching orbits. Yeah. So quantum and those mechanics are what is gives crucial, you the noise. Right. It's interesting. Quantum mechanics, I think, is crucial. You have to linearly superpose it to get Yeah, I think I think it, it's it's like that. Yeah. Um, so, so uh, I remember like uh, like uh, this wormhole can be viewed as uh, expansion from half, half wormhole or something. Somebody wrote that. Yeah, so I'll come that means that, also actually. quantum mechanics, right? So it's a higher, well, it's higher expanded. Theory, yeah. Um, yeah. So so this is all I wanted to say about the pictures. I now wanted to go on. If, where I have what five minutes left. Um, I'll, I'll talk about a few other points. And the first is the point that that Masanori, uh, sorry. That, that you just brought up, yes, yeah. that, uh, I, yes, I this is yeah, this is the one. Yeah, this is the one I was. Yeah. Um, you can ask. It turns out this is an interesting property. Um, in this one-point model, do perturbation theory in one over n. It's really one over n squared around the wormhole side. This thing is made of Grassmann numbers, so you know. If you expand out the action, it truncates after a while, after n terms. You just don't have any more Grassmann numbers left. If you look at the size of the terms, you find, not surprisingly, the, the fluctuations around the wormhole saddle rapidly decrease. They go like uh, 1 over m squared to the k for the kth term. And the coefficient grows. It's like k factorial. It looks like an asymptotic series. But here, when you go all the way out to the last term, the last term is of the same size as the first term. That's crazy. <laughs> and in fact, it is the contribution given by the half wormhole cell. And we, we knew about this, but we didn't understand the significance that Muhammad Zanoff really pointed out in, in a very nice paper. He did many more checks. 
the thing I liked it particularly is he pointed out that this is analogous to another model that people have discussed, the so-called tensionless string, in particular in a discussion that Everhart has given, where you can examine, let's say, the uh, uh, vacuum ADS and expand and wrap strings around vacuum ADS. And you find that if you expand in the maximum number of wrapped strings, you find out that you get the contribution, exactly the contribution you get from the worm, from the black hole, the Euclidean black hole geometry. So there's a way that this last term in the expansion is the same as a different geometry. And that happens here actually. So you sort of see that these different geometries are kind of linked in configuration space. And so, so maybe this is not just a silly coincidence. Maybe there's something going on here. I don't actually know what to say about it. But you'll notice that it's crucial that these two things have the same size for the half wormhole to cure the disease of the wormhole. So the next comment I wanted to make is about what happens if you have coupled left and right systems. The most interesting coupled system is when you're computing, let's say, entanglement entities and you have replica wormholes. Then the left and the right system, let's say the black hole and the bath, are coupled in the observable you study, the density matrix. And so you don't have a factorizing quantity. The thing you're computing doesn't factorize because the density matrix involves tracing out the bath for all systems. Now, a simple model of this is just add a direct coupling. This is something Mother Sena and she did a long time ago to our toy model. There's some constant times psi left times psi right. And then you can look at the model. And what happens is that the half wormhole contribution is still present, but the weight of it is no longer the same as the weight of the wormhole. It has exponentially suppressed weight. In decoupled systems where there is a factorization puzzle, there is a symmetry between the copies of the system that ensures that the wormholes and the half wormholes have equal weight. That would be like schematically like this. You have a wormhole and a half wormhole where the same uh, level of potential. You add a little perturbation and you lift the half wormhole. So what we expect is when you do page curve calculations, this noise, these symptoms of microstructure are not absent. They're just exponentially suppressed. Microstructure is an inevitable accompaniment to having a single uh, Hamiltonian. All right, the last thing that I'll discuss is the question, I guess, the, the 60, what is it? The uh, $64,000 question or the, uh, the gorilla in the closet, whatever the right metaphor is. What are these half wormholes? Well, as I was mentioning before, uh, I guess this should have said half wormhole geometry is probed. Uh, sorry, the half, the half wormhole geometry is probed to the depth probe by G left left. That's approximately this bifurcate point isn't the right word, but this point of time symmetry on the wormhole. What happens after? Well, it could be there's something like fuzzballs where there's really no horizons in the theory. And in fact, the configuration just stops. Here. And there's some, some you know, cloud of wrapped strings and stuff here. Now, that's one possibility, but it doesn't actually seem to be the way the model is, is, is working. Um, what other possibilities exist? There's an interesting proposal that Yiming Chen and Maldasena made based on some work they did here. Whereas you can imagine a more precise version of the wormhole in Minkowski signatures, this thing we call the double cone. And it, if this is the Schwarzschild R plane, this is just a piece of the Schwarzschild eternal black hole geometry. You imagine that R goes in to the branch point described by the horizon and then back out on the other side of the branch cut. R goes to the horizon value and then back out. So it's like two pieces of the eternal Ibs Schwarzschild geometry. And then you compactify 
periodically in short shield time. Now, the fact that you've gone off into the complex plane here means that this thing, get, this bifurcate orbifold singularity gets resolved by some complexification. Well, there's something else you could do. You could come in at R, hop around the, um, the singularity at the horizon, the branch point at the horizon, and then go all the way to R equals zero, which is where the singularity is in a higher dimensional black hole. And then the geometry might look something like this. You start out at, way at the boundary, you come in, you hit uh, the bifurcate point at the horizon, and then you go up toward the singularity. This is like the singularity. And there could be some way that uh, this half wormhole is you break this thing and guide it up toward the singularity. There is a solution like this. Uh, maybe the fact that the singularity is such a bad place, we can hide all of our ignorance in one place. Okay. Now we know that the black hole final state is, a, is an idea for creating certain kinds of uh, uh, detailed behavior in the black hole S matrix in an evaporating black hole. Maybe there's some relationship between the kind of noise you need in these half wormholes and the kind of behavior the black hole final state creates. We just don't know. And well, or there's some possibility we haven't thought of that probably is likely. Or it works completely differently. But in this simple model, the, the, the point I'll leave you with is that the complete gravitational quote unquote path integral has new contributions that we were surprised by. And these seem to help with some of these mysteries that were vexing. Okay, I'll stop there and I'm happy to answer whatever questions I can. Thank you, Steve. Mm -hmm. so, questions? Um, Steve, I, I had a question. Yes. Um, you were mentioning earlier that for, um, for Super Yang Mills, you mm -hmm. could think of the wormholes as emerging from like time averaging um, as opposed to doing some ensemble average. Mm -hmm. Would you say that you expect a similar kind of thing to be true if you just considered some generic matrix quantum mechanics where you're not doing any kind of ensemble averaging? Um, for example, like if you have like the C equals one string, it's just some ordinary matrix quantum mechanics and uh, you could compute the spectral form factor in that theory and then ask where the erratic fluctuations and you know, behavior like that now, could come from. Would you expect the, that the to problem, come from? That? The problem in that model is it's not chaotic. And so it won't have random matrix statistics. Uh, yeah, so- it's it, just free fermions. That's right. So it, it probably won't have like a ramp and, and things like that, but would, wouldn't it still have erratic fluctuations around whatever? Much, much less so. It will have wow. some, but they'll, they'll be of a rather different character. You could try to find, um, some, uh, you know, what the bulk manifestation is of those things in that theory. I don't actually know. And I mean, well, I'll give you a, relate, a related context where people have looked at it, which is um, think about um, the matrix, Manda matrix realization of JT gravity. Mm -hmm. It's a matrix, again, it's a matrix integral, but of a different kind. It's a, the rank of the matrices are e to the s, not just s or root s. And then you can say, suppose I take one draw of that random matrix. And so you have a fixed set of eigenvalues. You know, it'll have a, a behavior that looks like that noisy ramp if, the, if you pull the typical set of eigenvalues. And we sort of think we know a little bit about where gravity comes from in that model. Where does the noise come from? It turns out that the natural way to think about those models is in this many universe interpretation, 
that uh, goes back to Coleman and Gibbons and Strominger and that Maralf and Maxfield have adapted to the ads CFT context. And it turns out you sort of think of all these different eigenvalues as a kind of brain where, where you know, gravity, where geometry can end. It's a very complicated system, probably out of control. Recently, what uh, Phil and Shen Yu and I tried to do was build an effective description of that theory uh, where you don't actually fix the eigenvalues precisely, you fix them kind of approximately in a region that's adequate for describing the ramp. And then it turns out you add, you end up on a, uh, whoops, sorry. you end up on a description, on an effective description that looks a lot like this, huh. where this wiggly red line, and that's actually where we got the notation from, describes the effect of all the other large number of baby universes that would be hanging out here in the full many universe context. So you can think about this as an effective boundary condition that summarizes all this stuff. And then that gives a, uh, a, a realization of factorization, but here in that many universe setup. And you could say, well, maybe it's inevitable you need some many universe setup and you have to have alpha vacua and things like that. But it would be nice to, to get along without all of those extra boundaries. And, and that's what this particular uh, SYK model was designed to, to work with. You don't have lots of boundaries. You just have the, one, the physical ones. But there is a description like that in the system that you, it, it, that, like that. I see. Steve, could you give uh, the behavior of the GLL in the half arm geometry? Is it like uh, for small separation, it's, uh, it's like in the smooth bulk geometry, but after taking the last separation, it becomes some. Uh, well, it, it, I think the, the, the deepest, when you sort of separate it by half of a circle, I think, the, I think basically what it does is it kisses the bifurcate point. So I don't think you can really detect much about this region, no matter even at the largest possible separation. Okay. So so it doesn't give us a clue to that. I see. And that's well, that's just the way it goes. It's probably not an accident that that's the case. Uh -huh. uh, uh, so we don't we don't have good ideas about how to uh, about how to uh, learn about that. I see. That would be uh, well, that would be a good thing to try to figure out, but we just don't know what to do. Well, and for me, one of the sobering lessons about all this is how little we understand. I don't think this will be a surprise to you, Raphael, about this quote unquote gravitational path of it. I mean, it, it's. Uh, we just, I can confirm that I personally understand very little about it. Yeah, well, right. Uh, me neither. And I, I uh, believe it even more now. And, 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 and I guess the point, point, you know, I guess it's a good thing that the questions, natural questions to ask now bump us right up against that problem. That's been true for a while, I guess, but we're, we're finding more and more questions where that ignorance is really crippling. Well, you, you keep finding, you know, interesting lines of attack. What's, what's your next, uh, what's your next one? Where, where do you? I actually don't. In this problem, I'm, I'm a little stuck. I, I don't know. I, you know, I've been thinking about this perturbation theory around. Uh, all right, let's try it out. Let's try in super Yang Mills. When does the microstate show up if you perturb around a nice gravitational configuration? Does that give us a clue about, uh, you know, things we're missing? Uh, the. Um, I, I don't have a, a, a real, I don't, I don't have an active problem that uh, I think will, you know, a project that will shed 
dramatic light. It's, it's, I think we're in this hard place. Yeah, there's lots of things we're trying and, uh, you know, I'd like to know more about the singularity, but that's another one of these problems that we've bumped up against for years. You know, and so uh, uh, I, I don't have a good, I would like to understand some of these models like the, this tensionless string, what happens when you, it's not quite tensionless. So, so some of these higher dimensional examples, uh, when they're complicated enough to be chaotic, uh, and see see what if there's anything that they teach us. I, I but I don't I don't have a, a clear line here. Uh, so one of the reasons I am happy to give this talk is that it would, it would, I, I would hope that it, it's jog something loose in somebody else. But but it, it's it's hard. Um, and it doesn't seem, I'm not sure it's the question it's like just pure thought is going to yield. We need some system that we can get our hands on. I'm not sure what to do. That's, uh, well, that's as honest as I can be about it. All right. Well, if there are no more questions, then let's thank Steve again.